Hello. Hello, hello. <laughs> Welcome, Louise, to the Unpacked Show. How are you? I'm very well, thank you. I'm delighted to be here. I'm definitely the least glamorous person you've ever had on your oh, show. But I'm very to... happy to be here. <laughs> I was about to say, your hair and your outfit is looks beautiful. Absolutely. I mean, I don't... You're the most glamorous, maybe, actually, even. No. <laughs> Come on, flattery will get you everywhere. <laughs> <laughs> I love the bookshelf behind you. It's like, it's a complete yeah. library there. So you, Yeah, it's what, right, you know, there's actually a law that says writers are not allowed to do a podcast unless they have a bookshelf like this behind them. It's just, <laughs> it's on the statute books, you know, you get arrested if you don't have it. That's <laughs> it. So Faye told me quite a lot about you because obviously I'm sitting over here in Germany and she kind of, you know, filled me in with all your work. Before anything, a lot of people who are watching The Uncut might or might not know you. I would love hmm. for you to tell us a little bit about what you do. Sure. Uh, well, my name is Louise Doughty. Um, I'm primarily a novelist. I published my 10th novel last year, which was called A Bird wow. of Winter, uh, which was about a woman who goes on the run. So maybe more about that later. Um, but I really only came to wider attention with my seventh novel, which was a book called Apple Tree Yard. Oh. And the reason that one kind of exploded was it was adapted for television. It was a four part miniseries for BBC One. And it starred the fabulous Emily Watson, one of our great actors, who was just amazing. Um, Incredible. She plays a, a geneticist, um, very respectable woman with a suburban home and a nice husband. And then she commits one act of folly and the whole of her life spins out of control as a result. And she ends up on trial for murder at the Old Bailey. What can I say? Oh, um, I and then since Apple Tree Yard, um, I've moved into the wonderful world of television. Uh, another one of my novels has been adapted. That's called Platform 7. And that was on ITVX uh, in December with Jasmine Jobson in the lead role. Oh. Absolutely fabulous. And I've, oh God, I just sounded like this. I sounded like- I loved show. it. I did actually just say she was. She was amazing. Um, and I've also written a three-part original drama that was on BBC the year before last, and that starred Keely Hawes, another one of our terrific actors. So, I mean, how lucky am I? I've had three television series, and I've had Emily Watson, Jasmine Jobson, and Keely Hawes. So, you that's know, that's incredible. the thing about writing for TV. You get these amazing talents in your shows. Yeah, Keely was Crossfire, wasn't it? Yep, that's right, Crossfire, and that was a three-part drama, she was, she was just... Oh my God, you need to watch that one, Ramona, that was so scary, it was like two gunmen being loose on a resort. Yep, oh, it was oh about a, a gun attack on a holiday Honestly, resort. Oh and, my God, um, you're on the edge of your seat all the time. Oh my God, I might do that tonight. <laughs> <laughs> some popcorn and some of you. Yep. <laughs> <laughs> so what, what are you working on right now? Well, um, for several months, I've been promoting my work rather than working on new work. And oh. that's one of the things about being a writer these days, particularly when things go on the television. Um, you generally, with every book or every series, you have to spend several months on the road. So between September and December last year, I was on book tour in the UK. Um, I did literary festivals in Indonesia and Iceland, two very different wow. countries, but they do both have active volcanoes. Um, I've just come back from a festival in Sri Lanka, uh, which was a great privilege. Um, I'm off to Australia for the Brisbane Writers' Festival in May. And it's, it's a very strange thing about the literary world that it's full of writers who don't get enough attention. You know, there's lots of wonderful writers who don't get adapted for television or they don't get the attention they deserve. But then suddenly, you know, if you do get a bit of attention, you get a lot of attention and you don't have time to do the writing. But yeah. um, I am getting on with a new book now. A couple of television projects, Irons in the Fire. Uh, I am getting on with a new book, but I'm also an executive producer on the adaptation of A Bird in Winter. That's what's called In Development, which is something I'm sure everyone knows well. My God, you're a woman of so many trades. Oh, my God. Continue, just, please. <laughs> well, I'm, I'm, I'm just a bit of a crazed workaholic, I think. I don't really have much life. <laughs> I don't have any so, hobbies. So are we, don't worry. 
Um, being an executive producer as a writer is great fun because you're not really the producer who's on the front line. I mean, there are executive producers within the television companies who are the ones who actually have to make the shows happen. They're the ones right. you have to hire the heads of the department, the um, line producer, the director, and so on. Um, when you're an executive producer as a writer, you have a certain amount of power. You get to read the scripts at the development stage and give feedback. But it's not the same as, as being one of the producers on the ground. Um, yeah. And I think the main thing I've learned really over the last it's just how hard it is to get any television made, particularly television drama. It's so expensive to make. You can't really make an hour long episode for anything less than two million now. Oh, wow. Yeah. That's uh, you, how much it's jumped? Two million? That's how much it's jumped. Yeah, it used to be when, you know, Apple Triad was made, that would have been about one million an episode. And, you know, that was a nice, glossy, well made drama. Yes. But nowadays, really, you need two million. And obviously, for the, B the BBC don't have that kind of money. And yeah. so that means they have to do a co-production deal, co-pro deal, as it's called, with an American broadcaster or with mm -hmm. other broadcasters. Um, and it's very, very hard to get any television drama off the ground. So I've got my fingers crossed for a bird in winter, but we'll see. So a lot of people are signing with Netflix, aren't they? Just to get that budget and that production going. Is that yes. something you're going to look into? Oh, well, I'd love to see into. Yeah, I'd love to do something for Netflix at some stage. I mean, the thing about the streamers is you get more money up front to actually make yeah. the show. The streamers always have a big, a bigger budget than terrestrial broadcasters. But if you have a show made by the BBC, they can then sell it to the oh. foreign television outworks, networks, outworks, networks, um, you. and you get a small percentage of that. So Correct. there is a chance of, a bit like book royalties, of getting some money down the line. Whereas obviously if you sell to a streamer, it's a global broadcast and it that's that's just it. That's, you know, that's what you get up front. Really? So people don't get residual income once they go on Netflix or something like international? Well, that's a good question because I haven't had anything on a streamer yet. I don't know, but I can tell you that certainly with the iPlayer, you get something called click money, which is like a, a small royalty, like public lending rights in libraries, yeah. where every time somebody clicks on it on the iPlayer, you get a small amount. And I would presume, I'm only guessing here, you'd have to ask somebody who is involved with the streamers, but I would presume there's something similar with the streamers. So yeah. you, know, you have an enormously successful show on Netflix if you're in the top 10, uh, like One Day with David Nichols or something at the moment. You know, that's been such a huge global hit. Yeah. I would think there has to be some recompense for that. But um, as I haven't had a stream of show yet, I can't really tell you. Honestly, Apple Tree Yard, you just, when I watch programs like that, I think what's going through the writer's mind? Because <laughs> what, it's true. I know you said to me you like to go to quiet places and write. That's correct, isn't it? You said you like to go to caps and things. But where were you when you were writing that? Seriously? Well, probably all over the place. Um, I mean, I certainly wrote a lot of it in cafes. I know I wrote a substantial chunk of it in the British Library at St Pancras, um, in the reading rooms there. Um, but what is odd about the way I write? Well, I don't know if it is odd. I know some writers write this way and some don't, is that I don't write chronologically. So I don't sit down at the beginning, write the opening scene and then work my way through. Quite often I write an opening scene, but then if I'm not too sure what's going to come next, I'll leap ahead. And I might write a scene that appears three quarters of the way through the finished book. Yeah, um, wow. It, it's only towards the end of the process that I go back and it's a bit like a jigsaw puzzle. You know, I have the crucial scenes, which is normally the beginning, the end, a yeah. couple of turning point scenes that occur yes. in the middle. And they're like the corners. Yes. Yes. And yeah. then I have other scenes that I know, and they're like the straight bits. And then I fill in the gaps. Mm -hmm. So it does mean that if there's a particular scene that you're finding difficult in any way, 
you can just put a marker in and then you can carry on writing the book and you can go back at that at another at another time so where i was at in my head yeah the answer is all over the place <laughs> and obviously there was quite a big legal scene there what about the research do you actually go into law firms and find out all of this stuff because it was quite i did um i had a great privilege with apple tree yard which is i managed to get myself embedded with the crown prosecution service wow. and to spend every day at a three-week murder trial oh. sitting on the prosecution service benches that's and how what, that's how to do it it is it was incredible i mean what that meant is i had access to the jury bundle i was seeing i was seeing evidence that the jury were not allowed to see because if there was legal argument yeah. over a particular point the jury would be asked to leave the room until that was decided and the way that happened is i managed to find a crown prosecution service lawyer who was particularly helpful and sympathetic and she said okay what do you need and i said i need a murder trial with two defendants operating what's called a double cutthroat defense right and that is where the defendants blame each other yes yes now of yes. course you can imagine that the the prosecution loves a double cutthroat defense because then the two defense barristers do half the work for the prosecution trying yeah. to black each other's client yeah. and it all went quiet for a few weeks and then she rang me up and she said i've i've got the right trial for you and i had previously tried to get into the old bailey with a police officer who had tried to get me in the front door and had been told no nothing doing you know but obviously anybody can sit in the public gallery but then you're way up there and you don't have access to the jury bundle and the evidence and this cps lawyer said look come with me uh, on the first day of the trial dress like a lawyer so i was in my black trouser suit um she took me in the back way. The security guard went, hi there, hi, counsel, <laughs> to me. And I went, oh. <laughs> and she sat me on the CPS benches. She said, stand up when I stand up, sit down when I sit down. And at the end of the day, she sent a note up to the judge because obviously everything is at the discretion of the judge saying, you know, um, my Lord, as it's the old Bailey, it is my Lord and not your honor. Um, the lady sitting next to me was actually um, a novelist. Um, she very much enjoyed her day uh, in your courtroom and she, with your kind permission, would like to attend the rest of the trial. And the message came back, yes, and I was in. Incredible. And it was, uh, people were passing me notes in the court saying, counsel, counsel, you know, you know people did <laughs> think, assume I was a lawyer. Um, but the other really interesting thing about that is the CPS lawyer who had got me in couldn't babysit me for the whole three weeks. She had other things to do. So she charged the senior investigating officer um, from the murder squad, the SIO as they're called, who was sitting on the bench beside me. He was basically told to babysit this novelist, you know, make <laughs> sure I run a mock through the building. So that meant I was hanging out with the police team every lunch break, coffee break. And obviously then you get a different perspective. You hear things that the jury are not allowed to hear. Um, mm -hmm. And it, it was the most extraordinary research experience of my career, really. And it, that was why I was able to be so exact in Apple Triad about the legal procedure. And that's and why I brought that question up, because watching that, they really looked at each other in court, did they? Because, you know, mm -hmm. one minute they were together and the next minute she was thinking, what's going on here? Because she sincerely, yeah. she, she didn't know anything about it. She didn't know he was going to go in and do what he did. No, no. And um, I mean, that's very commonly the case that obviously when you have two or more defendants, by the time a case comes to the trial, um, people are obviously hoping to get off, but maybe hoping that somebody else gets the blame or goes down. And occasionally security guards do have to sit between uh, defendants um, uh, to separate them. Um, so it was extraordinary experience the by the way the courtroom you saw in the television series was not the real old bailey wow so uh the um the old bailey obviously they don't allow filming inside the old bailey itself so the television company had to completely recreate one of those modern courtrooms oh. uh, in a deserted aircraft hangar uh, miles oh my god and they took me on a tour of it 
and it was absolutely stunning the detail the size of the files on the judge's desk uh, the green baize cloth on the seats everything was exact and they built it they filmed in it for 10 days and then they knocked it all down um, and that's the kind of attention to detail that tele television dramas uh, have these days the expectation from the book to the adaption were you pleased the way it went? Because some people always say, oh, the book was much better. <laughs> well, the way I look at it, it's a win-win situation. Because if the television drama is great and everybody loves it, oh, they go out and write the book. Absolutely. If it's not so great, everybody goes, oh, the book was better. So, you know, mm. I've nothing to complain of, but I was very, very pleased with Apple Tree Yard. I have to give credit to the screenwriter uh, called Amanda Coe, brilliant screenwriter, really experienced, and also a novelist herself of some distinction. So she had real respect for the novel form. She didn't just sort of go in there and kind of rip the entrails out and make it as overly dramatic as possible. She really, really respected what I was trying to do in the book. And, yeah. you know, changes always have to be made. But I think the important thing is, has this production captured the sort of heart of the novel, what you're trying to say, what you're trying to say politically, emotionally. Oh, yeah, it's fantastic. Is it simpatico with what you were trying to do with the book? And I think they did that triumphantly with Apple Tree Yard and with Platform 7 as well, which I was adapted. Seen Platform 7, yeah. Yeah. I'm looking forward to watching that one. Um, Crossfire, yeah. if we go to Crossfire, Ramona, that's another one. Yeah. Where were you when you were thinking of that one on a sunny beach in... Malibu or something. <laughs> well, I did come up with that idea when I was on holiday with my family and I go. was lying on a sun lounger and uh, it was on one of those resorts which, you know, I'm sure lots of people have been to them. They're sort of horseshoe shaped. There's one exit onto the beach, there's swimming pools. And I couldn't help thinking, you know, my partner was off by the bar, one child was in the pool, the other had wandered off somewhere. Gunmen were to enter the premises now. And I think the truth is, and this is something a lot of people find upsetting, is we all want to believe we would behave heroically, that we would save our family, save the people around us. And the truth is most of us would be so terrified. We would freeze yeah. or we would run and hide. Yeah. You know, that that is the statistical truth. And interestingly, that is also true for special forces. Highly trained soldiers often behave in completely unexpected ways when they're in a real life emergency situation. None of us actually mm -hmm. know how we would behave. Mm -hmm. And I was really interested in exploring that, but also in exploring the idea that um, you know, we all have this kind of cliched views of these attacks, you know, that they're done by monsters. That, are... And actually, if you add in all the attacks, for instance, high school shootings in America, the vast yeah. majority of gun attacks are committed by young, disaffected yeah. white yes. men. Yeah. And yeah. I really wanted to tackle that, and it was controversial. And, and you I got, got that. Up. Yeah, because those two young lads, they, the poor young lad said um, their mother had lost her job, hadn't she? And she'd been sacked. Yeah, and they, yeah, one of the people. Yeah, they'd, had, they'd, been, they'd been dismissed. And I mean, the, the backstory is that their mother has been killed by a violent father. And right. I, I can't even remember how much of that we managed to get into the finished thing. But when you look into these occurrences, there are the, a history of domestic abuse in the family is often very commonly there when you look into what disaffected young men do. Mm -hmm. um, there's a wonderful um, academic and historian in America called Claiborne Carson. Um, mm -hmm. And I remember interviewing him once and somebody had asked him, what's the biggest threat to world peace? Mm -hmm. And he had said, young men between the ages of 18 20 to 25, particularly if they are unmarried, um, don't own property, have no stake in society. Yeah. And I think it's a huge problem. I mean, this is slightly going off topic. No, but no, no. Here of how we deal with disaffected young men um, mm -hmm. is obviously, you know. Well, that's uh, one of my 
biggest concerns, um, Louise, because you know I've been in education for 30 years and that is my, Michelle and I, we are both absolutely, oh, we're terrified of what's going to happen in the next 10 years because there's so many now. Yes. And, you yeah. know, your film, it was interesting because you, at first we didn't know what had happened to these boys. We I kept thinking, well, why would they do that? They seem really nice lads. And then later on, we found out because he kept saying, well, look what they did to mum or whatever. Yeah. And then you had that twist with the relationship. Now, that was a bit edgy, wasn't it? <laughs> I it mean, was, I know where it, you were then, but that relationship. It was. I don't, want, I, I don't want to give a spoiler on that. I mean, I think another way of explaining it is that in the drama, there are, in fact, three families on this holiday. So Keely Hawes is um, the mum in one family and yeah. she's there with her daughter from her first marriage, her husband and her two kids by her second husband. It emerges pretty quickly that their marriage is pretty rocky. Yeah. Um, Chena and Abelasa, his wife, and their three young boys. And then there's another couple who are a childless older couple who are also part of this friendship group. And I was a bit mean because at the point at the point the attack occurs, all three families are separated. There is no. So they've all gone no, on holiday together, but then they're all separated. They're all going to do something separately. Yeah. yeah, and then there are flashbacks to their interweaving relationships. Oh, it's fantastic! Um, That's the bits I like. You do that well because you did that in Apple Tree as well, didn't you? You like that. I like a flashback. I like a flash forward. I really like complicated time frames. Oh, no. And I think it's important to say um, with Crossfire that it's three episodes and the final episode is what happens to the families when they come back home. And I was very passionate about that. And that was the one line in the sand for me where I said, we have to talk about the consequences when people come back home to their real lives. Yeah. because these appalling events happen to real people and yeah. they come home and then they have to queue in Tesco's for a bag of sugar and real yeah. life is going on around them when this appalling thing has happened and you know most dramas they end when the bad guys are shot and the good guys survive but in real life these utterly awful things are a moment in people's lives. They have whole lives leading up to them and whole lives leading away. And I wish more dramas would tackle that. And I was very yeah, passionate definitely. about wanting my drama to tackle that. Yeah, but uh, there's two good ones there for you, Ramona, to watch. And obviously I haven't seen Platform 7 yet, which I'm looking forward to. Um, and you've got a new one, you're now in the, you're, you're right in one now, are you? Yes, I mean, A Bird in Winter, which is the 10th novel, um, came out last year, is uh, in development as an sorry, interesting... A bird, a bird? A bird, a bird in Winter. I probably have it here. We've written somewhere. it down here, Bird in Winter. A Bird in Winter, yep. Yeah. Um, and that's the novel about a woman on the run. And it opens with a woman in a meeting in an office block in Birmingham, in a room with a glass top table, coffee and croissant on the table, a group of colleagues. And as the novel opens, this woman is standing up and she's about to leave the room and she's saying to herself, it's no more than 30 paces to the lift. And she gets out of the building in a big hurry and she goes on the run. She goes to Birmingham New Street Station. She disguises herself en route. She gets the train up to Glasgow. Um, she disguises herself several times. She hides out in a deserted building. And then she ends up traveling um, across the Scottish Highlands and going up to Orkney, Shetland, crossing the North Sea illegally on a yacht. And the novel concludes in Iceland. And wow. during the course of her flight, we discover more about her and who she is and why she's on the run. Um, and it actually emerges that she works for the Secret Services. She's a spy, but she's not a field agent. She's in her 50s. Um, she's kind of a bit out of shape. <laughs> I wonder how I could identify with that. And um, uh, she works. She's a bureaucrat. She works for a unit whose job it is, is to um, catch corrupt 
spies wow. and she has uncovered a web of corruption and in fact there are two sets of people on her tail there's the, her former employers and then the paymasters who are paying the corrupt spies and she has to do something quite dramatic to survive at one point oh. um, so rich territory for drama and um, we're adapting it into a TV series. I'm not doing the script of this one either. <laughs> I think there should be a law against novelists adapting their own work, quite frankly. Um, but yeah, we're giving this one a go and hopefully that will be a TV series um, in a year or two. Oh, right, I've decided I'm going to be the woman and I'm going to be the runner. <laughs> <laughs> I, can I, actually... so relate, I can so relate my life to it, I'm telling you. If you heard my story, I think if you wrote, because I've started writing, I'm not a writer, forget it, I'm a businesswoman, but I've started writing um, a book about my life because it's so screwed up and I've been through so much in the last 10 years that if it like, I, I mean, Abu Dhabi's involved, Dubai is involved, Saudi Arabia is involved, Germany, England, uh, Europe, and it's a really, really, it's like I'm on the run in a sense and it's really is wow. something. But I don't want to say too much because I'm like halfway through and it took me a long time. I've been already, it's been a year that I've done only half of it uh, oh, because yes. it's just so much emotions. And I, and when I get into that moment, uh, I start audioing it rather than writing it. So I don't forget the feeling um, because I'm not a writer. I'm just trying to express really what, because this is real. This is really, really what yeah. happens based on a true story. Um, and I don't know how far that's going to go, but I'm definitely going to show it. That sounds you. absolutely fantastic. I can't wait to read that book. You have to finish <laughs> yeah. it. It's brilliant. Yeah, I'm going I'm to finish you... it. I'm going to let you read it. <laughs> well, you, you say you're not a writer, but you, you know, the definition of a writer is one who writes, you know, so you are a writer, yeah. you're writing it down. And, you know, there are certain skills that can be learned, you know, the skills of crossing a narrative or a sentence. But the most important thing is, do you have something to say? Yeah. Because you yeah. can get the most talented pro stylists in the world, but if they don't have an important story to tell, if they don't have anything to say, then they don't yeah. have a book. And you have something to say. You can yeah. learn the technique, but having something to say is the most important thing of all. And it, it sounds as though you you have buckets full of that that's fascinating I mean, I mean i mean how i how i i've been looking at it i've been relating it to my childhood because i've come from abusive childhood as well so what i've done is i've taken there's a past presence intense in the whole story in the whole book and i always relate there's flashbacks so basically what if you could say there's a scene in um, abu dhabi but with what's happening i take that back to my childhood so i've kind of done it in that way i don't know if it's all gonna make sense at the end but it is it is something brand new to me you know Faye knows I build clubs and bars and tech, tech companies but writing a book like writing my story um took a lot because I went through this like really heavy yeah. mental health journey and a lot of depression and happiness a rich life wealthy life and then sad and being things taken away from me that I worked so hard for and now putting it all in words and just kind of writing that journey again and then pulling back my you know my childhood as well into that book i think it's gonna be something but again it's just something new and i'm gonna see how that goes and i think because i'm listening to you and trust me i'm never quiet on the on the podcast <laughs> but i've probably been the most quiet since because you're talking and just talk, listening to you and you're like in your novels it's just so intriguing because i'm thinking about my story in the back of my head and uh, how that would be penetrated through like how you seen all these ideas and these thoughts so my question actually was are you looking to pull your own experiences or anything that you've been through into one of your stories well funnily enough i i do have a kind of long-running memoir on the go which is not really about me but it's about my parents um Wow. And my parents were both from very working class backgrounds in the East Midlands. My dad left school at 13, my mum left school at 15. And they worked very hard to turn their kids into middle class professionals. It was very much that, it's a particular thing of that generation. You know, dad was born in the 20s, mum was born in the 30s. Of that passionate belief that education is everything, the world doesn't know you are living, pull yourself up by the bootstraps. And 
Oh, to one extent, you know, they succeeded. You know, we've all, me and my brother and sister, had much more privileged lives than our parents had. But there is also a price to pay from that. There's a kind of uh, a kind of migration of class, which isn't is more than geographical. I mean, I've only moved a hundred miles south from the East Midlands. I'm now you know, fully paid up member of the North London liberal elite or whatever you like to call me. But in terms of class and expectation and life experience, that migration has been a lot more than 100 miles. It's been something very big. And I think when you live a life that is very different from the one that your parents lived, you can't help um, but feel some very complex emotions. I mean, pride in what they achieved, a certain amount of guilt, um, because my life is much more privileged than my parents was. Um, and then, of course, this complex situation we have now, which is people of my generation are the first generation who are looking at their children being less privileged than them because of the housing crisis that we have in the country, which only appears to be getting worse and worse because of the climate yeah. change crisis because of the Correct. appalling state of our politics, both domestic and international. Correct. So it's very strange to feel that maybe my generation, the lucky generation, was sort of, you know, the apex of luck. And then what are we what are we bequeathing to the younger generation? You know, what has my generation done to make life better for the younger generation? And the answer at the moment seems to be not enough and not much. So I do want to write about that, um, yeah. but I think it would be more it would be more about my parents and the political situation um, than it would be about me and my life. Um, I'm very lucky as a novelist. I get to write about myself in ways that are very highly disguised. Yeah. <laughs> you can get a lot off your chest and you still have plausible deniability, you know. Yeah. <laughs> so did you know that you wanted to be a writer, Louise, from a very young age? Because when did you first pick up a pen and think, this is what I'm going to do? Yeah, I did write my first novel um, at the age of 11. Um, oh, wow. I, I wanted it to, to be a hardback, so I, I cut out the cardboard exterior of a cereal box and I glued it to an exercise book so that my novel would be a hardback. You know, what can I say? I grew up in a small town in the East Midlands. There wasn't a great deal for entertainment. I was a bit <laughs> of what one of my teenagers once called a weirdo, saddo, loser, loner type person, you know. Um, oh, God. <laughs> and uh, I read a lot of books. Um, and then I think in adolescence, I think I, I wanted to be a great actor like I don't know, Glenda Jackson. I wanted to be a spy or a detective. Um, I went off to university. I did a degree in English literature where I got to read a lot of books. And then when I left university, um, I kind of thought, what do I want to do with my day? And that would be my advice to anybody who's thinking about what career they want, whatever age you are. When you get up in the morning, how do you want to spend your time? Um, because I think it's very easy to get obsessed with, you know, what's the career path, yeah. what's the job security. Well, but actually, most of us, our work is what we're destined to spend most of our life doing. Um, and once I'd asked myself that question, the answer was really clear, which is I, I wanted to be a writer. You know, I wanted to yeah. spend my life in a room on my own, making up stories. Tend to Norwich to study. I did. I did. Um, after I graduated from my English literature degree in Leeds, I spent a couple of years on the dole in Leeds, yeah. working on my first novel, which was really bad. Thank heavens, never published. And I volunteered for a women's theatre cooperative. We were all in radical women's theatre. We all went round the north of England in a minibus with a broken back axle, you know, giving... Um, oh my God about women prisoners in, you know, prisons and community centres. And we were all really passionate. We all had hair kind of a centimetre long all over, you know, <laughs> including our legs. We were all in 1980s agitprop theatre. I was very into that. Um, and then after a while, I thought, well, I, if I really am serious about this writing, I've, I've got to do some something about it. And I applied to do the MA in creative writing at the University of East Anglia. Oh. and. 
To my absolute astonishment, I got in. And to this day, I have no idea how I got my place uh, because I was very immature on every level as a writer emotionally. Um, and I didn't have the money for the fees, but my dad uh, had just been made redundant. Uh, and he lent me the money out of his redundancy pay. Oh, wow. So how's oh. that for filial guilt, you know, later down the line? Um, and then I worked in a nightclub um, to support myself through the MA until I was ignominiously sacked for giving free drinks to other creative <laughs> writing students. <laughs> so <laughs> they kind of picked me up, you know, one hand on the scruff of my neck, one hand on my belt. Oh my God. <laughs> out with the fish bones and the dustbin. So that was a bit unfortunate. Um, and after the MA, I moved to London and I, I lived at base, what was basically a squat in South East London for several years. Um, I did some part-time secretarial work. I did bar work. Um, I changed bed sheets in an old people's home. I just, I did the whole, I lived in this room with, you know, black mold coming down the wall and I had a mattress on the floor to sleep on and an upturned orange box to keep my books in. Um, and I mean, it sounds romantic in retrospect and particularly because I went on to have a successful career. At the time, it was utterly miserable. I just remember being ill all the time. I just remember having viruses all the time. Um, but you were in a then, room which was covered in mold, Louise. <laughs> I know, yeah. I'm surprised. Now we know how bad black mold yeah. is. You know. Um, and then eventually I started getting bits of work doing book reviewing for small magazines, um, gradually some arts features for newspapers. I wrote two novels that were no good and were turned down by everybody, rightly so. And then my big break came when I had two big bits of luck um, in the early 90s. I had a short story that got a runner up prize in a competition and a radio play that got a runner-up prize um, in a red, something called the Radio Times Drama Awards, sadly doesn't exist anymore, and that got produced on Radio 3. And then because of the short story, I managed to get a literary agent um, and eventually sold my first novel. But it, it was around 10 years from start to finish to go from wow, being that. Long time, to, it? yeah. It's a long time, and you know, I was young, I had the great privilege of only having myself to look after. I could do that whole, you know, living in a squat thing because I was young and I was naive. You know, it's much tougher, obviously, if you have a mortgage or a family to support. It's very, very hard because- It's interesting because JK Rowling, she talks about the hardship being a writer to start with. So it means that must be a really tough industry to be in. I mean, she had a she had a tough she had a really tough yeah. where she is now. Yeah, yeah. I mean, it, yeah, it, the 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 most common story for writers is that it takes seven, eight, ten years um, to get published, because you have to train yourself to be a novelist. And I always say, you know, think of it takes seven years to train to be a doctor or an architect. You know. Being a novelist is a skill you have to learn in the same way if you wanted to be a virtuoso cello player, you know, you would know that you had to practice again and yeah. again and again. Correct. Yeah. But of course, when you're trying to be a writer, you're not in a, a kind of socially acceptable journey. You can't say like I'm a medical student. You can't say that because you're teaching yourself. Mm. Um, but I think, you know, to anyone who wants to be a writer, I, I often say, think about it taking seven or eight years because we all have so many bad sentences we have to write before we write the good ones. Inspiring. You're <laughs> such an inspiring woman, Louise. So you oh, don't do many you. columns now because you did a column for the Daily Telegraph, didn't you? You don't do any I of did for the book section, I hasten to add. <laughs> the oh. arts could not comment. Um, yeah, I did a column for the book section of the Daily Telegraph, which was a how to write column. Nearly crashed the Telegraph's website because so many people were interested. Um, and I did some theatre criticism for a while for the Mail on Sunday. I was their theatre critic for a oh, couple wow. of years. I've written a lot of arts features and book reviews. But um, 
Television is a very voracious medium. And since I've been involved with television, everything else apart from the novels has had to go. I used to do a lot of journalism and broadcasting. I used to teach creative writing a lot, which I really enjoyed. Oh. But to be honest, you know, when the television people come calling, <laughs> they yeah. want you when they want you. <laughs> when they want and, you, yeah. Um, yeah. And at the moment, you know, I've got to make the most of that. And it's it's television and novels um, for the foreseeable future for me. Oh, gosh. Well, gosh. whenever you need an Indian, German, British actor, <laughs> you give Ramona a call. Okay, okay it's a deal. <laughs> maybe I'd be that running woman, you know, I don't know. <laughs> I love well, it all. I love it. I it, it does mean it. Because I went into acting and this is what I studied. I wanted to be an actor and I didn't realize my whole entire life was going to be a movie. Um, so God <laughs> kind of played it the wrong way. Yes. <laughs> but you know, it'd be good to actually be in a movie that actually doesn't reflect on my life. <laughs> yes. Well, there's that Guardian questionnaire question, isn't there? You know, who would play you in the film of your life? We oh, could all God. Be one, wouldn't we? I don't oh, know. I'm, I'm it's got to be you, Ramona. You've got to play yourself in the <laughs> who film. Would like, oh. Viola, who would play you? Who would play you? Viola Davis for me. What? Ah, uh, yes. Oh. Fabulous. <laughs> yes. Yeah. Viola Davis, 100%. Yeah. 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 It's superb. So, Louise, um, do you have uh, you have kids, right? And you're married. Um, um, how is that working out with? Because I know me, I work a lot. I don't have kids yet. I am trying um, too soon. Um, but you know, my home, like I have three dogs. They're like my, you know, my everything, and they're oh. a lot of work. Okay, a lot of work. Uh, when I was yeah, in Abu Dhabi, I found them in the desert. I brought them to Germany now, and now they're with me, and they're a lot of work. It's like having three children running around all the time. So me balancing them, my business, and my husband, how do you balance like your travels with your book? Because you're always, you know, of course, traveling. You just mentioned a couple of countries at the beginning of the conversation. How are you managing? Yeah. Well, um, the great thing about kids is they do grow up. And I have to that's say, a you know, that's a big plus. Uh, when the kids were little, I'm not going to lie, it was really, really hard. Um, because I've always been freelance, I did it without any childcare. Um, so I did it when the kids were at nursery or at school or when they took naps. And I have to say, I look back on that time now and I, I don't know how I did it, how I wrote those books and did journalism. And um, it was really, really tough. And at the same time, you know, I, I wanted to be at the school gates. I wanted to be there, but I it, there were a lot of times when I was really pulled in both directions and you, you end up feeling that you're you're not doing a good enough job as a mother because of the novels and you're not doing a good enough job as a novelist uh, because of the kids. But yeah. you know, my kids are in their 20s now and they're absolutely fantastic and they look after me. Um, and you know, I'm, I'm, I'm really, really lucky that that has happened at the same time as I've got the economic freedom that television has bought me. So, yeah. you know, I can just say, I can just say to the family, you know, I'm I'm off to Sri Lanka and they can all look after themselves. I have two cats because they just like stride off with their tails. Well, and they just they they tail off and they down. do their own no. thing. <laughs> yeah, I couldn't do dogs. Dogs love you too much. I just couldn't. I I, I couldn't. I've had two, I enough know, I, 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 in me for two kids. That's it. <laughs> I know. I don't think I had a choice at that point. I don't know. I'm just like if I have a home, if I have the money, and if I have a roof for the dogs that I see on the streets, there was like eight of them, like in a petrol station. One had three legs and one was aggressive, so they wouldn't take them in. So I kept them and then I flew them over to Germany and I, I just can't. I just even now my husband and me, let me tell you the story. I mean, I'm telling you, always crap happens to me, my husband. We were driving out of our house. We we're driving down the road just because we live on a hill here in Germany. We went down the hill. We went towards the uh, one of my clubs and there was a dog. And it was a really like, you know, like, a, like a Beethoven, you know, the movie, like a dog like yeah, that. It was, running, it was running down the road next to like little, um, crossing the road, crossing the, uh, the pavement, crossing back on the road. And guess what? There's my Audi and we're about to hit it. 
And then my husband breaks and I open the door and I run after it, thinking I'm faster than the car, which I'm clearly not. And it ran into the forest, so I followed it and everything went dark. Because here in Germany, it's very greenery, like where I live. And there's when you enter the forest, everything goes dark, even if it's daylight. Like all the trees cover it and you can't see. So there's me with my phone, lost signal, flashlights, looking for this dog and he's a bit dark and he's not doing anything and I slowly stop hearing his footsteps and I'm like shit I'm lost and I didn't know how to get out of there because I went so deep into the forest it's so I was a bit lost. like the beginning of a movie <laughs> yeah, screw the dog I was lost and then I walked out and then I went on social media because I have a big social media and my business social media and so I notified on social media there's a dog it looks like this please reach out and oh my god someone reaches out so i find out the dog's name is rocky so i started screaming rocky and i found him eventually obviously and then we brought him and then literally four days later the same thing happened again not with rocky but it was another dog and i said to my husband this is mind-blowing we shouldn't leave the house anymore because every time we do well we should because we keep rescuing a dog and bringing them home but i don't know how they keep getting loose out here but that's my story I think we're going around point. the dog community. You know, you're a you're a marked family now. They, <laughs> yeah, they're, they're all, just they're all telling me. each other. This will get it going. Let's run, let's run into the forest, guys. <laughs> that was crazy. Actually, you're right. That could have been a story. It's in itself, but yeah. Um, so, yeah. Louise, tell us, tell us, uh, is there anything else you want the public to know? Um, any upcoming features? Um, of course, you mentioned some of the books that you've already, the novels that you've already made and some of the ones that you're about to do. Um, is there a juicy, juicy project in 2024 that you have in your pipeline? Not really. I mean, the only thing I really want to promote, I suppose, is A Bird in Winter because it's tough out there for novelists at the moment. And, you know, I'm one of the lucky ones. Um, I'm established. I have a really good relationship with my publisher, but it's a very crowded market. And what tends to happen is, is it's a bit winner takes all, you know, if you have a, a bestseller or win a big prize, you know, that can snowball. Um, and I think we need, it sounds a bit portentous, but we need um, lots of different stories to be told. We need lots of different narratives out there. We don't want one particular story to become the dominant narrative. Um, yeah. So, you know, I would just say, buy, buy books, <laughs> please buy books. Um, books are incredibly cheap, you know, particularly if you buy them on Amazon or in a supermarket. Quite often, if you buy a book as a birthday present, it costs you less than the greetings card yeah, no, or yeah. the wrapping. Yeah. But authors still need to live somehow. And if you have a favorite author, buy their books, you know, go on BookTok, go on Instagram, tweet about them and eat, or even write to them telling them you enjoyed your books. But a, literary, a thriving literary culture feeds so many other storytelling opportunities. Um, you know, it feeds drama, it feeds films. You think, what are the three top Hollywood franchises of all times? They're all based on novels. Harry Potter, James Bond, Lord of the Rings. They're all based on novels. So yeah, it's support novel. novelists and read novelists if you can, because... Um, I would say that I think that human understanding between different types of human people, um, it comes through empathy and the imagination, you know, and when you read a novel, you get to walk in someone else's shoes. You get to yeah. be, you get inside the head of somebody who's maybe different from you, lives in a different country, different skin color, different religion, and you get to walk in their shoes and understand how they feel. And that's what I'm really passionate about as a writer. And so, yeah, buy books, read books, write books. They're all out there trying to do their bit. But, you know, human empathy is everything and made up stories, the imagination. Uh, that's how we're going to do it. Absolutely. It's wow. been so lovely. I mean, it's been Love really, it. really lovely, Louise, to have you on the show. Um, do you want to tell 
everyone who's watching how they could reach you um to you know read some of the books and novels that you have um how can they maybe your social media link or youtube or oh, you're gonna laugh at me honestly this is where i reveal how old i am <laughs> and also how utterly hopeless Faye knows this already because we talked about it how completely hopeless i am on social media i do have twitter i do have instagram i hardly ever post i hardly ever tweet i know nothing about it i've been told <laughs> i have to go on tiktok because book talk is so huge i'm still don't do tiktok um book to be talk, honest okay. I mean, i've got a website <laughs> I've you have a website. Book talk. Yes, please, somebody write about me on Book Talk. Apparently, that's the book big talk. thing at the moment. I've, I've never known. And, and I promise. Is it like TikTok, is it? It is basically, it's a part of TikTok. Part where of TikTok, but it's Book Talk. Yeah, I've seen it as well. Yeah. yeah. And apparently, it's huge. You know, people recommending books to each other on TikTok. It's, it's wow. massive. And I really mm -hmm. should engage. And as Faye knows, I've really got to get better at my Instagram. I think a lot of it is that, you know, I'm a novelist. I take 350 pages to say anything. So this is why I'm so happy with social media. I just can't be pithy. You've seen how many words I like to use. But I promise, I swear, I will try and get better. In fact, Faye's going to tell me off about it at a later date, I know. I'm going to try and get better at my social media. But in the meantime, I've got a website and the books are out there. And the most recent one is A Bird in Winter. And Platform 7, uh, which was the one before that, is it's a book about coercion control we haven't even got onto that but um in particular young women and relationships and coercive control yeah, what, what, what and about? wow yeah wow. is it why so, it's called, um, said, is it a train is a tube or a train line is it it's it's set mostly on Peterborough railway station. I know that sounds like a really weird place to write a novel, but it's narrated by the ghost of a young woman who has died on the station. And this is why Jasmine Jobson is so fantastic in the television adaptation, because she has to play herself in flashback, but also play herself as a ghost. She has no memory, oh. she doesn't know why she died, and then she has to investigate her own death and um, discover what really happened. That sounds really, oh, I'll be watching that. That's on TVX, that one, I think. That's ITVX, yeah, yes. that's on the yes. stream, and it will be yes. on ITV Terrestrial later this year. So just tell us your handle, www. This is your website. Um, yeah, the, the website is, yeah, um, it's www.louisedoughty.com. On okay. Twitter, I'm at Doughty Louise. And Instagram, oh my God, Faye, what's my Instagram handle? It's something like uh, Louise Doughty Author. <laughs> yeah. Um, I will make sure to add your Instagram link onto the uh, link of the video and on YouTube and on our TikTok. Like, I will do all that for you. <laughs> Thank you so but, much. But I, I really do suggest you, you know, start, you know, like books need to be heard, writers need to be heard. And I think social media is, you know, the new thing, you know, unless there's a power grid cut, like they say it, there will be in a few years or, you know, in 10 years. But till then, there's the internet. And we need to be able to promote and you need to, you know, tell these stories. And that's the best way to reach. I know a lot of people travel around different countries and they promote the books. Mm -hmm. But really, all you need now is a TikTok account. I, I, <laughs> or an I know, Instagram and account. I mean, you know, I, re I, re I write the stories to reach an audience. So um, I, I promise I will try. <laughs> well, it's been a pleasure and... Again, if you need an actress, an Indian, for any of your stories, I'm available. Um, I'm sure well, Faye will jump in for a character too. <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> it's been fantastic and your time is valuable and you've given us an hour of it tonight. So that's really nice. Oh, it really wow. been, it hasn't seemed like an hour. It seemed like five right. minutes. It's been such a pleasure to chat to you. But we can have part two when the, A Bird in Winter's out. That would be yes. lovely. Yes, I would love to do that. Thank you I'll very much. See you later yeah. on in the year sometime. Yeah. Well, best of luck. Thank, with thank you so much. And, and thank you so much uh, for your interest. And it's just lovely to talk to you both. And I'll message you, Louise. Oh, yes, I'm going to add thank her. You. I'm going to add <laughs> you. And I will make sure I'll support, of course, all your, you know, all your novels. I will make sure to share it to my crazy, crazy people on my pages from all around the world. I'm sure, you know, we're going to catch some amazing readers from there. 
Oh, thank you so much. I really appreciate it. Thank you both. Thank you, Louise. Have a good evening and we'll speak soon. Yes, you too. Yeah, bye. Bye. bye.